Thank you for downloading episode 46 of the Murder Mile True Crime Podcast. Before we begin, please take a moment to listen to this important message. My name is Sean Connolly. I was James Bond. Murder Mile makes mugs, and mugs makes me smile. Yes, folks, that was Sean Connery, and he recently visited the Murder Mile eShop to treat himself to a very exclusive Murder Mile mug. Mugs. As well as ebooks. Ebooks. Badges. Badges. Stickers. Stickers. Ringtones. Ringtones. And even bespoke goodies. Ah, balls to it. As well as a whole host of other treats that Sean Connery can't pronounce. Other celebrities who wholeheartedly endorse the Murder Mile eShop include professional buffoon Boris Johnson, reality TV star Donald Trump, nobody does the bestest, bigliest Murder Mile mugs but me, okay? Slapstick 1980s Russian villain Vladimir Putin, these mugs are worth... One million dollars. And unelectable, unelected British Prime Minister, Theresa May. Buy a mug, or I'll give those Irish fascists another billion pounds to not do exactly as I say. As well as other famous folk, such as Bobcat Goldthwaite from Police Academy. (coughs) Hugh Grant. (laughs) Al Pacino. Wow. She got a great mug. Christopher Walken. Ow, I got a mug in the ass. And Sean Bean. Buy a mug, you bastard. To browse the Murder Mile eShop, go to murdermiletours.com or simply click on the link in the show notes. The Murder Mile eShop is not endorsed by any celebrity of any kind ever, even the really shitty ones. And the voices you just heard were piss-poor impressions done by me with no rehearsal or thought. If you believe they were real, you're an idiot. Thank you for listening, and enjoy the episode. Welcome to Murder Mile. A true crime podcast, an audio-guided walk, featuring many of London's untold unsolved and long-forgotten murders, all set within one square mile of London's West End. Today's episode is about the death of Freddie Mills, a boxer, a celebrity and a businessman, whose untimely death in a Soho alley is shrouded in so much mystery that parts of it have become myth. Murder Mile is researched using the original police files. It contains moments of satire, shock and grisly details. And as a dramatisation of the real events, it may also feature loud and realistic sounds. So that, no matter where you listen to this podcast, you'll feel like you're actually there. My name is Michael. I am your tour guide. This is Murder Mile. Episode 46, Who Killed Freddie Mills, Part 1. Today, I'm standing in Goslet Yard, a dark, drab and gloomy dead-end street, secreted off the choking fumes of Charing Cross Road, and just a stone's throw away from the Lion's Corner House tea room, where deluded dreamer Jacques Tratzert gunned down his siblings. Denmark Place, where one of Britain's worst mass murders occurred. And the former Moe & Co brewery, where eight people drowned in a tidal wave of one and a half million gallons of beer. Coming soon to Murder Mile. Being barely 80 feet long and 16 feet wide, but going nowhere, Goslet Yard truly has no purpose. As with no houses, no shops, no cars and no people, only a back door to Starbucks, the bins for Borderline, 
a sea of swirling litter, and several steamy lumps of doggy dumps. It's almost as if Gosland Yard was made by mistake. Even the now defunct pub called the Royal George, literally built in the middle of the street, looks like it was delivered to the wrong address, and the postman thought, ah, sod it. Formerly on the right-hand side of Gosland Yard was the former Cross and Blackwell warehouse, which loomed six stories high, as half a block of dark and imposing Gothic architecture left the yard in eternal shadow. And what was once merely a quiet place to park up at the back of Freddie Mills' night spot has now been bulldozed and reduced to rubble, with the only sound being the drone of diggers, the tremble of trucks, and the eternal grunt, fart and belch as six workmen stand around, staring as one man digs a hole, with fags in their gobs, bacon sarnies on the go, and one hand scratching their butt cheeks, before they all take another well-earned tea break. Ah, a job well done. And yet, it was here, on Sunday the 25th of July, 1965, in the ominous quiet of Gosland Yard, that boxer, actor, and celebrity club owner Freddie Mills either committed suicide or he was murdered. So who was Freddie Mills? Frederick Percival Mills, known by everyone who loved him as Freddie, was born on the 26th of June, 1919, as the youngest of four children to two doting parents, Thomas James Mills and Lottie Hilda Gray. As a working-class family living under the shadow of the First World War, life could have been rough. But being instilled with a solid work ethic by his scrap dealer father, a sense of pride by his housewife mother, a love of play by his adoring siblings and all within the fresh air of Bournemouth, a small seaside town on the English south coast. Freddy's life was good, and at the centre of it all, always, was his family. Gifted his first set of boxing gloves, aged 11, Freddy quickly fell in love with the sport, and with his family's encouragement and full support to fulfil his dreams, He'd regularly spar with his older brother Charlie, already a semi-professional boxer. And whilst earning his keep as a milkman's assistant, he was trained by the brother and boxing partner of Welsh former lightweight champion, Gordon Cook. Freddie was a good boy with a big heart, a beaming smile, a loving family and a passion for boxing. So don't think that this is going to be a story about a poor kid, raised in a slum, who used his fists to fight through the mean streets of gangs, drugs, guns, and ultimately, his death. Because it isn't. By the tender age of 16, Freddie had gone professional. And having honed his skills as part of Sam McEwen's boxing booth, a fairground attraction where local men could fight professional pugilists. Here he learned not only how to fight, but also how to win the hearts and minds of the crowd. As Freddie became both a professional boxer and a talented showman. Between 1936 and 1939, although he was a middleweight boxer, Freddie fought middle, light heavy and heavyweight boxers. And across 64 professional fights, he drew seven, lost nine, and won 48. Three he won by knockout. And although he wasn't a very skilled fighter, with a dogged mix of pressure, persistence, and an uncanny ability to take a pounding, so beloved had Freddie become amongst boxers, promoters, and crowds, that he was blessed with the nickname of Fearless Freddie. In 1939, he was the Western Area Champion. In 1940, 
he beat the Eastern Area Champion. Having enlisted in the Royal Air Force as a physical training instructor to serve his country during World War II, in 1942, Freddie won the British and Empire Light Heavyweight titles, beating the reigning champion Jock McAvoy on points and knocking Len Harvey, dubbed the Prince of Boxers, right out of the ring. By 1948, at the age of 29, Fearless Freddy became the World Light Heavyweight Champion, a national hero, and was one of Britain's greatest boxing idols in the post-war era. Freddy was a dedicated athlete, a charismatic entertainer, a winner, a hero, and a gentleman. But don't think that this is going to be a story about a punchy pugilist whose fall from grace sees him used as a hired goon for an East End gangster, whose death was to be expected. Because it isn't. Having wisely retired from boxing at the peak of his success, Freddie Mills was one of the few sporting icons to break into television. And although, with a broken nose, he had a face like a melted matinee idol, being blessed with a cheeky smile, twinkling eyes, and a childish sense of fun, Freddie became a family favourite, presenting the music show Six Five Special, being a quiz show panellist on What's My Line, and appearing in several British films such as Carry On Constable and Carry On Regardless. Freddie Mills was a lovable character, a charming personality, a trusted celebrity, and he absolutely loved it. But don't think that this is going to be a story about a famous face who smiled for the cameras, and yet, deep down, he had a dark and twisted side. Because it isn't. Freddie was a boxer, an actor, and a businessman. But first and foremost, he was a faithful husband and a doting father. And having married Christine Marie, also known as Chrissy, on the 30th of September 1948, not only did Freddie become the proud dad to two daughters, Susan and Amanda, but he also raised Chrissy's son Don as his own, and all of whom he adored. For Freddie, life was perfect and there was nothing he loved more than his family. And yet, at a little after 1am, on Sunday the 25th of July 1965, in the back seat of his silver Citroen DS19, with a single bullet wound to the head, 46-year-old Freddy was found dead. But how? And why? The afternoon of Saturday the 24th of July 1965 was sunny and bright. As under a cloudless sky, Freddy stood in the back garden, skimming the leaves off his swimming pool and smiling with delight as his beloved daughters played and giggled in the garden. He'd made a good life for his family, they were healthy, happy and wholesome, living harmoniously in a newly built two-storey detached house at 186 Denmark Hill, in a middle-class part of Brixton, South London. And as he soaked up the sun's warmth, dressed in a pair of shorts, as a 46-year-old man, he was still in good shape. And unlike many Xboxers, he'd still got his health, his life and his livelihood. At 4pm, having struggled to sleep properly for weeks, being burdened with the usual worries of a businessman, still recovering from a bout of pneumonia, and with his sleep pattern having gone to pot since he'd opened his own Soho nightclub called the Freddie Mills Night Spot just two years earlier. Whilst Chrissy and the girls went out shopping, Freddie popped upstairs for a mid-afternoon nap. 
by 7.30 p.m. Having barely slept a wink, as an all-consuming headache raged in his brain, Freddy slugged back a coffee as he snuggled on the sofa with his girls, giggling at the loony antics of the Morecambe and Wise show. And as much as Chrissy pleaded with him to take the night off, he couldn't, as being a film star, a boxing idol, and a showman with a solid work ethic, Freddy had a club to run, a family to provide for, and a legion of fans he would never disappoint. At 9.40pm, as per usual, being dressed in a smart dark suit, a crisp white shirt, black polished shoes, and a stylish checkered tie, Freddy kissed the girls goodbye. Having made plans to meet Chrissy and his 26-year-old stepson Don at the club, and hopped into his silver Citroen DS19. The journey from his home at 186 Denmark Hill to his club at 143 Charing Cross Road took 45 minutes, and he arrived at roughly 10:30 p.m., having taken no detours. And although he would usually park up outside of his club on Charing Cross Road, his car being keenly watched by Robert Deacon, the doorman. That night, with his head furiously thumping, Freddy pulled off the bright lights of the busy city street as he crept his car into the silent darkness of Gosler Yard. So far, nothing out of the ordinary had happened. With co-owner of the club, Andy Ho, not arriving until 11.15pm, and Freddy being less of a manager and more of a famous figurehead, whose role was to compare the cabaret, shake hands with the fans, and pose for photos, Freddy knew he wouldn't be needed until midnight. So suffering from a blinding headache, and having asked the doorman to wake him in about an hour, with his car secreted in an unlit, Secluded but peaceful passage, Goslet Yard was the perfect place for a little nap. As instructed, at 11.45pm, with the cabaret band tuning up, Robert Deacon sauntered down Charing Cross Road and turned right into Goslet Yard, ready to wake Freddy. With structures on all sides, a row of brown bricked worksheds to the left, two black fronted garages ahead, and the tall white rear of a vague office space to the right. As the night had almost no moon, and with a single street lamp too far away, the eerily silent dead end was plunged into blackness. At the end, diagonally parked, with its bonnet facing the far right corner, and his boot to the street. With its engine off, lights out, and being barely visible amidst the gloom, was Freddy's silver Citroen. Being only three weeks into his job as the club's doorman, 23-year-old Robert Deacon approached the car cautiously, as although Freddy was a real gent, with him feeling unwell, being the boss, and having had a few drinks to pacify his pounding head, Robert knew it wasn't his place to be too pushy. As Robert's feet clumped along the cobblestones, he sidled up to the passenger side of the dark-lit silver Citroen and saw the unmistakable stocky silhouette of Freddy. Sitting bolt upright, with both hands flat on his lap, and his head slumped slightly forward. And yet, oddly, he wasn't in the driver's seat, but in the back, behind the passenger seat, totally still and ominously quiet. Eager to wake his boss, with the rear window open, Robert called out, Mr. Mills, as his knuckles rapped on the car door. But Freddy didn't move. He hollered again, Mr. Mills, but still, there was no reply. Opening the left rear door, 
Robert shook the big fella's broad shoulder and barked, Mr. Mills, it's time. But unusually, for a man with lightning-quick reflexes, there was no reaction. Smelling the booze on his breath, seeing his comatose state, and spotting a froth of saliva form around Freddy's mouth and nostrils, Robert thought nothing more of it, and went back inside the club. Roughly 40 minutes later, with the cabaret delayed and the crowd getting restless, the club's 47-year-old head waiter, Henry Grant, entered Gosselet Yard. And being familiar with the boss's occasional need to nap, but his insistence on never missing a performance, Henry vigorously shook the Xbox's left shoulder, shouting, Freddy, wake up! As with a firm hand, he sharply slapped Freddy's face. But Freddy didn't blink, wince, or budge an inch. Dashing back inside the club, Henry alerted Andy that his boss didn't look well and tried to telephone Freddy's wife. But with Chrissy being en route to the club, she couldn't be reached. At a little after 1 a.m., Chrissy and her 26 year old son Don arrived at the club. But there was no time to drink or dance, as with a great sense of urgency, the club's short and portly co-owner, Andy Ho, ushered them both outside and took Chrissy's arm as he frog-marched them both to Gosselet Yard. Sidling through the yard's dark gloom, up to the ominous silence of the Silver Citroen, as she saw the familiar silhouette of her seemingly dozing husband, Chrissy gently cooed through the open rear window. Freddy! Freddy! Hoping to wake him. But as before, he didn't answer. Eager to rouse him, Chrissy moved round to the rear driver's side door and calmly sat on the back seat. A tender arm reached around Freddy's broad shoulders as she shook him, cooing, Freddy! Freddy! But again, he didn't budge. And although the yard was dark, and inside the car was even darker. Being seated next to Freddy, at his feet, Chrissy spotted a .22 rifle, propped against the seat in front with its muzzle upright. And down his crisp white shirt, she saw a slowly spreading pool of blood, which trickled down his cheek from a bullet hole in his right eye. Clutching Freddy towards her, Chrissy cried, Andy, Freddy has shot himself, call an ambulance! As she held him close, his blood staining her blouse. But already, with help on the way, his face was cold. The ambulance arrived at 1.39am. But on arrival at Middlesex Hospital, Freddy was pronounced dead. So where's the mystery? What we're dealing with here is surely a suicide. A lone businessman suffering from depression and riddled with debts, who has a few drinks to quell his headache, parks his car in a dark secluded dead end at the rear of his own nightclub and with a .22 rifle pointed at his head, he shoots himself dead. There was no sign of a struggle, no screams, nor shouts. No suspicious characters were seen. No drugs or poisons were found in his system, just a moderate level of alcohol. Only his fingerprints were found. There were no threats on his life, and he had no known enemies. Even his own wife was heard to cry out, Freddy has shot himself! And after a thorough police investigation, on the 2nd of August 1965, the coroner recorded this as death by suicide, confirming that Freddie Mills had taken his own life.
It all seems simple enough, right? Well, not quite. You see, there are a few elements to this case which don't make a lot of sense. For example, no one saw or heard anything, not even a gunshot. No fingerprints were found on the gun, not even Freddy's. Unusually, for such a loving family man, there was no suicide note. That night, he had made plans to meet his wife Chrissy and his stepson Don at the club and had expressly asked Robert Deacon, the doorman, to wake him just prior to midnight, ready for the cabaret. And finally, Freddy was shot, not in the head or the heart, but in the eye, which, based on his injuries and the lack of powder burns to his lid, that suggested that his eye was open at the moment he fired the shot. All of which are elements which could be easily explainable, but there are a few elements which are not, such as the alcohol. Chrissy confirmed that Freddy had only drank coffee at home. We know he didn't take a detour on his 40 minute drive from his home to the club. Nobody at the club had served him. No bottle was found in the car. And yet, Freddy's blood had 37 micrograms of alcohol per 100 milliliters. The seating position. Freddy had supposedly shot himself in the face. And yet, if he had, why was he sitting in the back seat of his own car? Why was he still sitting upright? And why, if he had been holding a rifle with the muzzle aimed at his face, were both of his hands found flat on his lap? The timing of the death. Freddie parked in Goslett Yard at 10.30 p.m. Robert Deacon struggled to wake him at 11.45 p.m., as does Henry Grant at 12.30 a.m. and Chrissy at a little after 1 a.m. And yet, even though Freddy was clearly in medical need, no one called for an ambulance for one and a half hours. The bullet holes, there were two. One bullet was fired from the rifle into Freddy's right eye, and the other was fired from inside the silver citron into the base of the passenger side door. And even stranger is the weapon itself. Firstly, if Freddy had shot himself, with the incline of the rifle's muzzle aimed at his head, having pulled the trigger, surely gravity would cause it to fall towards him. But it didn't. It fell away and was found leaning against the driver's seat in a very neat, upright position, almost as if it had been placed there. And secondly, Freddy didn't own a gun. No one had ever seen him with a gun. And yet, the gun which ended his life wasn't your average lethal weapon. It was an FN self-loading .22 caliber Belgian repeater rifle. The kind used to shoot targets at a fun fair. And if that's not strange enough, why did the police not investigate the scene until several hours after the body was found? And why was the body of Freddie Mills and the rifle moved from the scene of the crime before the police had even arrived? Within eight days, the police, the pathologist and the coroner had concluded that Freddie Mills had committed suicide a verdict which his family openly disagreed with, and the case was closed. But was this a suicide, or was it a murder? The facts just don't add up. And as those who knew Freddie started to talk, details started to emerge, and alternative theories began to form. Was Freddie really just a depressed ex-boxer 
who was secretly struggling with crippling headaches and depression? Was he a businessman who ended it all over a series of bad debts? Was he a loving family man who made a snap decision to kill himself without saying goodbye to the ones he loved? Or did Freddie Mills, the charming, fun-loving gentleman, have a secret dark side? Was he in debt to the Mafia? Were the triads trying to muscle him out of his Soho club? Did he pay the infamous gangsters known as the Cray Twins to end his life? Was this married man a secret homosexual who was depressed after the death of his gay lover? Was this all part of a police cover-up to disguise a bungled investigation? Or was Freddie Mills, the light heavyweight champion boxer, beloved film star, an all-round family man, the sadistic murderer of eight prostitutes whose bodies were left ripped and naked across West London? Was Freddie Mills, the infamous maniac known as the Hammersmith Stripper, and is this the shameful secret that he took to his grave? The only way to know is to find out who killed Freddie Mills. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. Don't forget to tune in next week for part two of Who Killed Freddie Mills? And if you're a murky miler, Stay tuned for more Extra Mile goodies after the break. But before that, here's my recommended podcasts of the week, which are Out of the Shadows and Dumb and Busted. On May 19th, 2017, Netflix released its newest docuseries titled The Keepers. In this series, director Ryan White explores the unsolved murder of sister Kathy Sesnick, who taught English and drama at Baltimore's Archbishop Keough High School, and the believed cover-up by authorities in the Baltimore Catholic Church of sexual abuse of students by Father Joseph Maskell. A few years have now passed since The Keepers was filmed. Needless to say, there is more to the story. Join myself, Shane Waters, and my co-host, grassroots investigator from The Keepers, Jim Hoskins, as we continue the conversation and investigation into the unsolved murder of sister Kathy Sesnick, as well as the cover-up of sexual abuse by the Baltimore Catholic Church. Out of the Shadows can be found on all podcast listening platforms and at shadowspod.com. What podcast brings you true stories of exceptionally smart and insanely dumb crimes every week? Dumb and busted, obviously. But Hannah, where is your one-stop shop if you want to hear about a killer nurse, a pervy arsonist, or a group of hella old dudes breaking into a vault? Dumb and busted. Allison, come on, seriously? We host the show together. Okay, last question. Where can I go if I need to hear the number one song of 1999, I Want It That Way? What? The Backstreet Boys album Millennium? How did we even get on this tangent? Oh, okay. Sorry for being the only one who's ever fallen victim to their tight harmonies and timeless songs. Anyway, please listen and subscribe to Dumb and Busted on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, or anywhere you get your podcasts. Crime you later! A huge thank you goes out to my new Patreon supporters, some of whom we'll get to find out who killed Freddie Mills days before the whole world and who all get free ebooks of the Murder Mile scripts as well as more goodies coming soon it's like a veritable murdery Christmas these lucky people are Dina Seagate Jessica Shannon Tracy Armstrong Nina Colliver Beth Kelly and Olivia Wallace Thank you, ladies. You are all truly amazing. Murder Mile was researched, written and performed by myself, with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult With No Name. Thank you for listening, and sleep well.
Thank you, Mama Alice. <laughs> Thought I'd run out of breath for that. How are we all? We all good? Yeah? You all well, happy? It's been a while, hasn't it? I apologise for that. Research. Doing research for the big finale and for the for this uh blah, 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 this two parter. Oh dear. Uh but it's been good. It's been good. So yes, we did. I hope you enjoyed that. We did the, the, the three extra mile episodes. Hope you enjoyed that. Uh I thought I'd rather I just didn't want to give you nothing for five weeks. I thought I'd give you three episodes that might be interesting. And then we have a little bit of a break and then we come back. Um, so to uh, anyone who's new uh, to Murder Mile for the first time, this is Extra Mile. This is the extra bit that we do at the end of each show, uh, which is where I dive in more into the case that we've just discussed and give you some extra details and information and stuff like that. Uh, it's unscripted. It's unedited. Uh, there's lots of waffle. There's me sitting here. Oh, having a stretch. Oh, I needed that. A stretch. Got my cup of coffee on the go. Haven't got, any, haven't got a cake today. I know. I haven't got any cake. So uh, I've got a penguin biscuit and a Kit Kat. Ooh. Do you know why? Because I was sorting out all the Murder Mile mugs yesterday. Murder Mile mugs available from Murder Mile. Murder Mile eShop online. All going very well. I think 20 people have now got mugs now. I've got 20 more hidden away. Uh, but I put loads of... Inside the Murder Mile mug... Really nice white little mug with Murder Mile written on it. And you get uh, badges and stickers and a fridge magnet. And I also put some sweets and biscuits in there. And there's always a mixture of biscuits. So kind of donkey biscuits and some boiled sweets that you can have. And I was, I was filling up all my mugs last night. And I realised I've got some biscuits left. And uh, so I'm going to treat myself in a bit to a penguin biscuit and a Kit Kat. If you don't know what a penguin biscuit is... Uh, is it British? It's made by Mavitis, isn't it? It's basically just a basically a chocolate coated biscuit, which I only found out last week is what it is. It's a bourbon biscuit. It's a bourbon biscuit coated in chocolate. That's all it is. Never knew that. I love penguins and I love bourbon biscuits. I never knew that a penguin was a bourbon biscuit. And then a Kit Kat, which is a wafer biscuit covered in chocolate. Yummy. I'm going to treat myself to those very shortly. Anyway, this is Extra Mile. Um... So before I start, I just wanted to say uh, thank you not only to all the uh, Patreon supporters. You're fantastic. You really, really helped me uh, keep going with this. Your financial support really does help. Uh, uh, but also, I, do, I just want to say thank you to... Uh, there's been quite a few people who sent me some lovely gifts as well, which has been really nice. I've put in a lot of weight recently because of these gifts. Uh, but they were they were uh, Sue Harrison, uh, Marie Harris, Paul Little Nell, Lisa Lebo, all of you have been very generous um, and sent me some lovely, lovely goodies, which has been really, really, really very much appreciated and has really kept me going and has made me very chunky as well. Very chunky at the moment. Things are wibbling that shouldn't be wibbling. Uh, so I'm, I've, yeah, I've had to put myself in a bit of a strict diet at the moment. <laughs> It's not good. Although I do love cake, the problem is I'm a glutton. If like if there's do you know if there's a cake in front of me, I can't just cut off a sliver and then put it away. I'm, oh, I just have to eat it all. It's like if I have a big bar of chocolate, I can't just break off a a cube, have it and put it away. I have to have like a row, and then if if it's like if the row is odd numbers, then if it's like nine rows, then I have to have break off another one I go well okay that's eight that's even numbers that's better for me but then I look but then my brain looks at it and goes hang on that's not an even quarter it's just over so I break off until I have a half and then by the time I get down to half a bar of chocolate I say to myself sod it I might as well just eat the lot which I do which is why I pig out very easily uh so thank you very much uh, uh Sue Marie poor little Nell and Lisa thank you so much for your gifts it's very much appreciated um and also thank you everyone who's been sending in some really lovely emails and messages and you know tweets and stuff like that and uh you know just really lovely all over the last couple of weeks it really really does mean a lot and i appreciate the time that people take to write these messages as well it really really does mean a lot and and i always you know me i always reply to everyone as well um uh, i think i think sometimes sometimes some people out there the negative people out there. Uh, I think I think they they th kind of forget that we're not big faceless corporations. We are just like little people sitting in bedrooms creating lots of free entertainment for everyone, uh, just just for love and you know, um, positive feedback and love is like really so much appreciated. It really does spur us on. 
but sometimes there are people out there who are a little bit negative and you know uh, I've I've seen podcast podcasters just give up I've seen them break because I think for every 10 lots of love that you get that one can really hurt and it can really as I say get into your craw I try to ignore those ones anyone sends me anything anything negative I just ignore them had some weird ones recently. I'm not going to go into them because these people can live in their own little private little world. But some people really, really quite pedantic about tiny details that are really... Someone told me that I was a really nasty, horrible person because of something that I said in an off-the-cuff comment about... Do you know, I'm not even going to go into it. I'm not even going to waste my time with it. Anyway, thank you so much to everyone who's been really lovely and uh, uh, sending lovely gifts and all the kind messages. And, you know, it really does mean a lot. And also, thank you so much to everyone who's purchased um, Murder Mile mugs. This has been great. My e-shop e e e is up on the Murder Mile website. Uh, we are, thank you to everyone at the very start who helped me out. There's quite, quite a few people who are like we can't work out where the checkout is and it's like right okay i'll, I'll bug it up somehow i do you know it's taken a while to get everything right and i haven't do you know i kind of do you know the, we, we've still got a slight problem with the the shipping thing where if you buy a mug uh some people put in uh it's meant to be automatic that you buy a mug and then the, the website is meant to know exactly how much it is to charge you for but because i sell cards which are like 100 grams and a mug which is half a kilo my website, for some unknown reason, will only deal in kilos. It's probably used to dealing with drug dealers, of which I'm not a drug dealer. So it doesn't know the difference between a card and a mug. So sometimes people buy a mug and they, I, I don't blame them, they're excited. They get, they get, let's just get to the checkout and buy the mug. And then they, and then I see at the end that they bought a mug, which is half a kilo, but they've only paid for the shipping for a card, which is 100 grams. And it, you know, there's a big difference. Uh, so I apologise, there is a shipping issue on there. Make sure if you are going to buy a mug, or two mugs, I've, I've worked uh, three, three, four or five mugs, I've worked out the weight ratio for that. In all regions, international, whether zone one or two in the world, or Europe, I've done all that. It's taken me a bloody long time. Uh, it should be automatic, but make sure if you're buying a mug that you've got the shipping that it should say, if it's cards, it says card only, or if it's mugs, etc., it says mugs and assorted. So you, so you can actually buy a card and a mug and you won't be charged for the cost of a card and a mug. They're combined. That was a bit boring, wasn't it? Anyway, um, Murder Mile eShop, very exciting. We've got eBooks in there. I'm working of eBook one is up there. Some competition winners have won that. Patreon uh, supporters automatically get an eBook. They're only three quid. They're really good. Uh, ringtone, uh, you get a personalized card from me, a Murder Mile card with badges and all that. Um, personalized messages on there. And I've even put on there now, as a present to someone, if they love Murder Mile, I will dedicate an episode to them for Christmas or, or birthdays or whatever, or, or just whatever. You get a dedicated ep episode right at the start. So I'll send them a card saying, congratulations, blah, blah, blah. Here's your Murder Mile badges. And this episode is dedicated to you. And then right at the start, it will say, this episode is dedicated to blah, blah, blah. You don't have to write, I don't have to say blah, blah, blah. Or you can make me say whatever I like, whatever you like. I don't mind at all. Uh, but there's more goodies to come. I'm still working on it. So um, to everyone out there who's bought a Murder Mile mug, I'm raising my Murder Mile mug to you. And I'm get, I know I'm breaking my rule that I said I won't drink during uh, a show, but I'm going to have a swig. There you go. I'm raising my Murder Mile mug to you. Uh, now, Extra Mile. Normally at this section, as you know, I would go into uh, further details about the case. Um, I'm not going to do much about it here because this is episode one. This is a two-parter. And what I've deliberately done is used episode one as the setup. So I've given you a lot of information here. Some of it might seem irrelevant, but it's not irrelevant. Basically, everything that you've just heard has a place and a purpose. Um, so this is all really useful information. And then in episode two, we're really going to strip everything down and we're going to dissect absolutely everything that you have just heard. Um, originally, this was going to be my episode 40. This is episode 46. Um, 
in the end, uh, uh, a friend of mine, Aaron, let me finish, let me finish, let me finish. Uh, Aaron, very kind, let me finish, let me finish. That's Aaron's catchphrase. Let me finish. Um, Aaron messaged me and he said, oh, uh, BBC are bringing out a documentary next week called uh, uh, Death in Soho, the murder, or murder in Soho, the death of Freddie Mills. And I was like, oh, okay. Right on the day that I I finished writing this episode and was getting ready to record it. So I watched that. And I was like, oh, should I put them out at the same time? And then I watched the BBC documentary, which was 90 minutes long, and it was just a hodgepodge. It really was a hodgepodge. There, there, there's a lot to cover in the Freddie Mills story, but you have to sit down and go, methodically go through it very carefully. And I'm not criticising the, the uh, Fact Tent department, if it was Fact Tent who did it, or if it was documentaries uh, over the BBC, because I know a load of them really well, because I used to work there years ago. Um and I'm not having a go at them because, you know, they, they work under a tight deadline and, you know, they don't have a lot of money. But then again, I work under a tighter deadline and I have no money. So there's no bloody excuses. Uh, but that documentary was just awful. I'm going to put a link to it online. Uh, watch it if you want to. It won't spoil the show for you. I, I guarantee you. Listen to this episode if you want, want. It's online. You can go. It's on YouTube, I think. It's called uh, uh, Murder in Soho, Who Killed Freddie Mills? Have a look at it. It's 90 minutes long. Um, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, ugh. there's no real conclusions in it. And the, the ending is just, watch it just for the ending. Just to see uh, uh, Don McCorkendale, who is uh, Freddie's stepson and Chrissy's son, sit down with son of a gangster it was just the worst permatan in the world. And this is meant to be the big finale where the, the son goes, yeah, my father said uh, that this guy yeah did this and that he killed Freddie Mills. And there's no proof. There's nothing there. It's literally, literally, you have two men sitting in front of each other saying, one saying, uh, yeah, my, uh, my father killed like your dad and stuff. And it's just like, yeah, it's like, okay, prove it. The amount of stories that I have in Soho, like you know, episode two, the Tony Mella story, you're, if you go back in time, go back to the episode two, one of the really early ones I've just re-recorded. Uh, Tony Mella, very cruel Soho gangster, cheated his uh, very kind-hearted uh, business partner out of about £500. Uh, his business part partner shot him and then killed himself. Uh, but his business partner, Tony Mella, was basically cut up uh, for cheating Billy Hill, who was like the uh, Soho kingpin. Now, Mad Frankie Fraser said that he cut up Tony Mella. I've also got ten other gangsters who said that they cut up Tony Mella. But none of them went to the police at the time to say, hey, I cut up Tony Mella, because gangsters don't do that, because they, they don't want to be arrested. But decades later, they're happy to go, oh, yeah, I do. They claim to every single bloody murder out there, and yet they can't prove any... They don't give any proof at all. So all these kind of gangsters are like, yeah, yeah, I did it. Yeah, it's all bollocks. It really is. Oh, God, they're so annoying. They'll claim for everything, but they admit nothing. So have a look at that documentary. It won't really won't spoil the episodes for you. It, there's no smoking gun at the end of this episode. It just really is bits and pieces. But also there's some interesting things that they put in the documentary that I will entirely disagree with. And they even pull out, I'm using air, air quotes here, they even pull out experts. And this is one of my big bugbears in life, that uh, people do pull out experts. I'm doing it again. Or they pull out people who are like got doctors and degrees and stuff. I've got a degree, it means shit. Um, pull out doctors and all things like that. And they go, well, we found this doctor and this doctor says this. The problem is you can get 10 doctors, give them the same piece of information and they will probably come up with 10 different theories or five different theories or two different theories. But they won't all agree. You could get you could be sitting on a bed, lying in a hospital bed with a cough, a cold, a headache and itchy toes and tingly fingers. And I guarantee you, even though all of these doctors have probably went to the same university and done the same courses and have most of the same experience, they will all go. Uh, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know. So uh, this could be gout. This could be MS. This could be, you know, there's loads of theories you could come up with. So just because they pull out one expert, it doesn't mean that expert is right. But this is what they've done. 
have a look at the documentary. It's a bit wish wishy washy. Now I'm not saying that my episodes are going to be uh, everything. Do you know? It's not going to be like uh, the Bible. I hate to use that word, but it's not going to be. Do you know everything that you need to know to solve the case? But what I'm doing is doing what I always do: is very, go through everything very methodically. I'm not going to do what, like what some people do, where they go. Uh, there's a book out there which is heavily criticised by his family, which we'll go into next week, where they say that Freddie Mills was definitely, definitely the Hammersmith stripper. Whereas if you look on this documentary, the what's his name, Michael Litchfield, the guy who wrote it, he said, yeah, yeah, I'm about eighty percent certain, eighty percent certain. Ugh. Anyway, I'm not going to go into any more because I don't want to spoil this week's episode. Anyway, um, if you've listened to this part one so far, um, message me with your theories. Let me know. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. Or you can join the um, uh, the Murder Mile discussion group on Facebook. That's a good place to have a kind of a conversation. Um, uh, I, I tend to keep it quite uh, strict. You, you're kind of not allowed to post other stuff that's not murder mile related but i do open up theories in there and you can you know message me on there and say this is what i think it's going to be i'm going to post something like that next week and say what's your theories and everyone can post there there literally i guarantee you there won't be any spoilers on there it will be uh, there's so many theories uh, but i'm going to rip apart all the theories uh next week but this really is the episode that kind of establishes everything you need to know um, even all the stuff like the boxing stuff I did at the start, that's all really important. Uh, and I've tried to piece together every kind of theory element without going too far into it. Uh, so how did I find out about this case? This was another one of those ones where I was in a pub and someone was like, uh, this was ages ago, years before I started Murder Mile. And they, they were talking about the, the murder of Freddie Mills. But as always, it, it had already gone through the the myth mill and already he was already starting to talk about Freddie Mills being the Hammersmith stripper or whether he was a gay man uh committed suicide over his gay lover or whether he was murdered by the Cray twins or as some people say murdered by the Richardson gang who were rivals of the Cray twins um all of this we'll go into next week uh I'm desperate so desperate not to give stuff away um so Luckily, with this case, there was a National Archives file. It was open, uh, been open a couple of years ago. Obviously, because in police terms, it was it was a shut case, um, deemed death by suicide. Um, so in there was really useful. It was all the witness statements, autopsy reports, crime scene photos. Uh, got loads of crime scene photos. So I'll post them on the Instagram page and the Facebook discussion page and the other facebook page i've got two on there as well one for discussion one for just posting stuff um really interesting file as with the others it was it wasn't particularly thick it was only probably about two inches thick this one um but there were they the police sometimes what quite often what they do is they'll put in all the information that they need in there as well so even if there's letters from people saying I think he was murdered by such and such, or like in this case, because it was because he was a well-known personality. They had lots of people who claimed to be psychics. Yep, inverted air commas again uh, with their theories, and you read them, and it's fantastic. It's just oh god, just nutters out there, absolute nutters. But all of this feeds into the myth, and. For me, it was really useful because I was able to look at like I, I, the first page I opened up and it instantly it was a letter from someone saying this is who I think killed Freddie Mills. But it's the start. It's it's kind of it shows where the kind of myth mill starts. It goes in waves, as you can kind of expect. So when. When the murder happens and when a newspaper years later uh, brings something out and says, oh, remember this case, all of a sudden there's a surge of people going, oh, yeah, I remember. I walked past there that night. And people's memories are hazy. There's elements to this case where people's memories are totally hazy. But um, 
no, so so the, the, the myths come out and the theories and the people oh god, there's just so many. The police kind of kind of they have to deal with all this is what I feel sorry for them for. They have to deal with these people. All these people who go, I I had a dream last night that Freddie was murdered by Barbara Windsor and it's just like, oh the problem is they have to deal with it. And you can see all the correspondence in there where the policeman's like, we've received this letter from this lady and she claims to be a psychic and, blah, 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 and he has to send it to his higher up who has to deal, who has to say, OK, we need to reply to this. And they, you know, they have to deal with it in a proper way because the last thing they want is for it to come back and bite them in the ass a couple of, a couple of years later. Uh, so they have to deal with it and it uses up so much police time. Really, people need to... Ugh. Stop believing that they have magical powers or that the trees are guiding them towards who killed Freddie Mills. Oh, Jesus Christ. Anyway, um, so uh, that was really useful. The, the archives file was really good. I, As always, I try not to use newspapers because newspapers are full of crap. But uh, I did use some newspapers in this case to, as I just said, about the, about the myth making. The myth newspapers are kind of the outlet for myth making. So that's the only reason I used uh, the newspapers. Um, both mostly based all the information on the, on the witness statements. They're kind of quite useful because you learn a lot about people's lives from there. And uh, you know, hearing it in people's own voices is really important. Not just the cut versions that the press send out. Because obviously they use really, really, really tiny bits of witness statements to uh, so to serve their purpose. But when you read a witness statement in full, you get a really, really good flavour of the person and what they're like and their personality. Uh, and it, you know, it's really useful. Um, but there are other things that I use to research these cases. I do this with everything, every every story that we do. So I try not to... I try not to be too. Uh, I try not to believe too much in what people say. Do you know? Um, because even though someone says this is absolutely the fact, it's not the fact. As as uh, police will tell you, a person's memory is only like they only say it's like what thirty forty percent accurate. Your visual memory is not particularly good. Uh, they even they even say that, that when you're looking now, you're only really looking. You're basically looking through a pinhole. They say it's like it's only about two percent that you're actually looking at, but everything around that is the fact that your brain has just seen it and it's interpreting it. So what you're seeing now, like if you're say stare at something immediately in front of you. So say I'm looking at my screen now, and in front of me is the word rain. Now, I can see the word rain and my brain, my eyes are seeing the word rain. But everything else around that and around me in my peripheral, so the, what we're probably talking, like 280 degrees peripheral that I can probably see with my eyes, that is not what my eyes are seeing because human eyes, because we're predators, face forwards, whereas everything around is interpreted by the brain. So my brain knows at the moment that my hands are waving around and my brain is interpreting the movements, but it's not really seeing it. Or, or it's, it's, it's seeing a version of it, but everything else is kind of made up by the brain. So uh, your brain interprets a lot. So what I try to do uh, when I'm reading people's witness statements is I try and um, not just use their words, but work out the interpretation of it correctly or as near to correct as I can kind of make it. So... Goslet Yard. Obviously, I know Goslet Yard. It's in the back of Soho. I walk past it every day. Um, but a lot of people said it was a dark alley. Well, it's it's it's, uh, it's 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 a yard, really. An alley is kind of thinner, but you know, it's it, it's a it's a yard. It's uh, however long I said it was earlier on. Um, so, um, but because everyone says it's a dark alley, there is variations of dark. It's like what what does dark mean? It's like. Uh, it's like uh, sitting in my boat. Like uh, before, my stepmom very kindly made me some very, very lovely curtains. I used to have the old curtains which were in there, which were th really thin. And when I'd switch off all my lights and make the inside of the boat dark, the light from the outside would shine through the curtains, and I could still read a book with the curtains closed. And yet, technically, it was dark. Whereas now, with the blackout curtains in, when I switch off the lights, it's pitch black. But it's the same dark. It's it's still dark. So that's what I wanted to work out was uh, how dark was this alley? Because I think it, it, it tells us a lot about... Because if you think about it, um, 
Robert uh, Deacon, the doorman, uh, found Freddie Mills with froth around his mouth at 11.45. There is, he did actually uh, come and see him slightly earlier at 11.15. And Freddie was, Freddie was, uh, I didn't put this in the story because it slows it down, but Freddie was already awake and he was like, no, 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 come back in about half an hour. So uh, 11.15, Freddie was still alive. Um, 11.45, when Robert Deacon turned up, Freddie had froth around his mouth. But obviously, because he was coming in from the left and the alley was dark and inside the car was dark, he couldn't see that the, uh, not only was there froth, but he also had blood down his his shirt and he'd been shot in the eye. He'd approached him from the left and it was the right eye. So um, Robert didn't see that. The head waiter, uh, Henry Grant, didn't see that. So that really helps us define how dark this was. Actually, Don McCorkendale, the, the son, was there. He he said it was, it was almost pitch black. Um, and there was a street light, but it was too far away, so everything was absolutely pitch dark. I've got pictures of the alley, but it's all taken in daytime, so it's hard. So I had to interpret it that way. Uh, so one of the ways that I did this was uh, firstly working out where all the street lamps are. There was only one. Also working out the height of the building. So I was using architectural plans to work out uh, the height of the building from either side. Uh, it was a three-story on the left, uh, three-story in front, and it was a five-story on the right. And it's a very thin alley as well, uh, with very little light. Um, I also used moon phases as well. I kind I find this quite useful sometimes. Um, so it was gone midnight. Uh, I'd already checked the weather. Um, the weather had said it was a clear. It was a clear night. There were no clouds. Okay, so that was really good. So if there was a moon and the moon was in the right place, that would have illuminated the alley. But looking at the moon phases, this was in. Uh, it was just about to go to new moon, which is so no moon. So it was about two, one to two days prior to new moon. So it was basically there was a, a sliver of moon, but but not enough. So either way, the alley would be absolutely pitch black. And Freddie was right in the corner as well. So there's no lights. No one could have seen anything. So that makes sense. And it, it makes sense that they wouldn't be able to see that he had blood going, dripping down him because he, he, he was wearing a dark suit. Yes, he had a white shirt, but you could only really see that. All the blood down his face when you saw him from the right-hand side, which is only his wife did. So uh, so I, I, those kind of details I find really useful going into it. Do you know, like like when someone says it's, it's raining uh, that day, there's a difference between rain, especially if, if you're if you're British. You, pff, God, we have about th- we have about a thousand different words for rain, and there's a big difference between torrential rain and that kind of horrible drizzle that really soaks into you, or or the fine mist, or do you know, so things like that are really useful because it helps tell you uh, how people feel that day, whether the evidence is washed away. Do you know, all these kind of little details are really useful. People might just think, oh, do you know, just say it was sunny, but you know sunny there's a difference between difference between sunlight gloomy sun that kind of really low level kind of winter glaring stuff where where if you were to look east you'd be absolutely blinded but if you look west everything's neatly illuminated so i i really go into those details because i think they're really important i know people probably think they're not but they are um also people's memories aren't that good so it's useful to backtrack as well like um the family said that they were watching them watching Morecambe and Wise that night. Um, it wasn't on that night. It wasn't on that night at all. As far as I can find, it wasn't on that night. So, uh, but again, that's memory. Do you know, they will remember sitting in front of the telly and they, you might say, oh, the night before we watched that, but it could have been two weeks prior. So um, I sat down, I do that, go through, I go through the, uh, the TV guides for the night to work out, do you know, uh, how accurate is the memories? Our memories are awful. They really are. They they, they can't be a hundred percent relied on. Even with like the uh, with the ginger ray case, do you know? Um, oh no, not the ginger ray case. Sorry, the uh, Brian Alexander Robinson case. Remember the Jamaican guy with the deformed arm who was uh, a, a sta- uh, who stabbed a racist. Uh, there were fourteen racists who surrounded him outside the Limbo Club. Um, even. The Jamaican people's uh, recollections were pretty good, actually. But 
the the Deptford boys and the racists who were around there, all of their memories are 14 people in the same place and they all had different recollections, which is very interesting indeed. Uh, so yeah, no, so to research his case, uh, oh dear, my leg, uh, use moon phases, weather, a TV guide, uh, architectural plans, street maps, uh, old photos. I love trolling through old photos of, I've got some photos of Freddie Mills night spot online and the building that it used to be, cause it was only demolished, uh, Freddie Mills night spot where it was only demolished in 2006. And I think it was called, I think it was called Dionysus. It was, it ended up being converted into a kebab shop. Uh, very nice. I remember that very briefly when I was working here. Cause I, yeah. So, uh, yeah, no. And also obviously, uh, I've had discussions with locals and boxers and various psychiatrists and things like that. So it all feeds into this story. So it's all those little elements of research that, that really help uh, push me towards writing these stories and, and uh, again, hopefully, hopefully a conclusion. But that will be next week. Who, who killed Freddie Mills? Ooh, exciting. Uh, so I'm not going to say any more about that. So I don't want to give too much away. And also I've got a Kit Kat and a penguin in front of me. Oh, it does look good. Uh, so, uh, oh, just before we go, um, so while I was away, obviously doing the research for the big multi-parter, of which I am not telling anyone what it's about yet, but it's all researched and it's all ready to go, uh, and so I will be uh, doing that very shortly. But what I did while I was away was, um, because I had an old crappy microphone when I started doing Murder Mile, the early episodes, episodes 1 to 13, the the audio, I re-listened to it recently with, with slightly better earphones. And, oh, God, it was so awful. It was really scratchy and horrible. Ugh, it really annoyed me. So I, I went back and I re-recorded and re-edited episodes 1 to 13, uh, thinking, oh, God, this is going to be a real nightmare. Because episode 1 took me probably three weeks to record. Uh I was really having difficulty, like just pronouncing the words, and oh, I'd, I'd made it quite difficult to pronounce as well for me, anyway. Um, oh, d just to say, because uh, I've re-released, because I've released ebook one of the Murder Mile scripts. If you want to now, because episodes one to thirteen have been entirely redone, and they sound really good as well. I've kind of tweaked with the sound as well. Uh, go back and listen to episode one. Uh, sorry, uh, episodes one to thirteen using the ebook. There's lots of interesting pieces that you would never have heard before because i edited them out uh this will happen a lot more in the later ebooks i'm doing ebook two now which is episodes 11 to 20 uh which has got the dennis nielsen's in it episode ebook three will be coming soon that's got part of the blackout ripper and then ebook four will take us up to episode 40 and then we'll do ebook five when i'm when those series are finished, when I'm up to episode 50. Uh, but yeah, no, have a listen to them. So I was re-recording all of these episodes. Uh, and I would, you know, I always struggle with recording. Because uh, obviously, even though this is my own text, I'm, I'm dyslexic and my, my dyslexia kind of uh, forms into... Um, uh, and it, I, I find it difficult to form my words. My lips just kind of don't give up. I'm, yeah, they're, they're off. Oh, um, I just can't say the words and i really struggle and like the first episodes like even though it was only half an hour long it'd take like two two hours to record but interestingly as the more podcasts i do the more this is getting slightly easier now i think i've learned a rhythm so when i went back to re-record episodes one to 13 i thought oh god okay episode one is going to be a nightmare that'll take me a couple of days to record to get it right and i literally flew through it it's like i i, I did a quick read through because i was Re rewriting and trying to get rid of the spelling mistakes for for the ebook and then i recorded it and i literally flew through it it was like all the stuff that was really hard before to pronounce was it was all of a sudden it become quite simple it was easy and i was like i don't understand why this was such a nightmare before and i think what has happened is that because this is now my routine that i spend all my time writing and then I spend a lot of time re rehearsing the lines and then I record them. That I think I think it's really helped my dyslexia that having to having this routine to do is kind of I think that's kind of the thing that if you do have dyslexia you kind of you kind of shy away from it and you, you, you don't do too much reading. I love reading, but you don't do 
read, you don't read out loud. You kind of sit in your own little world reading your book. Whereas I think cause, because this is a podcast, because I'm forced to talk out loud to, to you guys so you, can, so you can hear me. Otherwise, that would be a really shit podcast if, uh, if, I, if I just was reading to myself and not saying any words. But I think that really helps. It helps me form the words and now all of a sudden like I could kind of whiz through this like this episode uh it'll probably be like a half an hour episode uh and it took me about 40 minutes to record so there wasn't too much stumbling over so so weirdly I think that's the kind of the key thing is that if you are a dyslexic and you have problems with reading not just sitting down reading is important but reading out loud to yourself I think it's that muscle memory it's kind of forming the words it's it seems to have really helped me um so yeah hmm i thought that was quite interesting might not be who knows okay so <laughs> i'm gonna wrap up for this week uh because i'm going to edit uh this episode and start writing part two of who killed freddie mills um and then get get on to the big multi-part series and i'm gonna move my boat and i'm going out for some drinks later on yes and then i've got a penguin and a kit kat to eat so um thank you so much all for tuning in thank you so much for supporting uh murder mile hope all murky milers are well and i will see you all or you will hear me oh this is that thing it's all oh i've cocked it up again i'm just gonna say goodbye okay bye bye